and welcome. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this, uh, the last plenary of, uh, of our conference, also the second week. I hope you're having a wonderful experience so far. I am Belisa Torres Narvaez, Assistant Professor at Oxford University in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Uh, I want to recognize not only that Minneapolis is in the ancestral and sacred land of the Dakota people, but it is also home to thousands of Native Americans and indigenous people from across the continent. It is also the home to Native American theater artists like playwright Sharon Day, directors Rihanna Yassi and Curtis Kirby III, and the Native, New Native Theater and Churchill Theater Collective. So I invite you, if you know Native uh, American artists of your area, if you're a Native American uh, theater artist yourself, to please add those names and shout out to them in our chat. Minneapolis is also the site where George Floyd was murdered um, and where the rebellion started. And it is the home to many, many black theater groups uh, like Penumbra Theater and Blackout Improv. Also to many theater artists like costume designer, Trevor Bowen and theater artist, activist, educator uh, like Shaq Cage and Harry Waters. So also, if you want to give a shout out to Black artists in your community, or if you're a Black artist yourself, uh, please add those names in the chat. Today's plenary is titled Humanizing the Digital Pedagogy, although we're not sure if it's humanizing the digital pedagogy or humanizing the digital pedagogy. I think both will work. It's um, the last in the conference, like I said, and we did a call, of course, when we had to, as the um, conference committee, we had to rethink the conference. One of the first things that came out was uh, having this uh, theme for our plenary, and we made a call to our members, inviting them to share how they innovated and experimented in order to face the challenge of teaching theater remotely at a short no notice during the pandemic. Uh, before we start with our presenters, a few housekeeping reminders. First, if for some reason you can't see this plenary fully, uh, or if you missed any sessions, rem remember that they're all um, recorded. So you can always go back to them. There would be for 45 days in the schedule. And also we invite you to type your questions in the Q&A session. And that might be new to you. It's in the lower bar. Uh, on the right side of your lower bar, there's a little icon that says Q&A. So um, it will be easier for us to keep track of them instead of the chat if you are, um, if you have them there, okay? And at the end of each presentation, um, of the whole presentation, I will be reading those questions to our panelists. I'll remind you too, in case you forget. So thank you very much. Let me see if there's any question for me here. Um, okay, I think we're all set. So without further ado, our first panelist, panelist is Derek R. Munson. Derek is the new assistant professor of theater studies at Illinois State University. Congratulations to him. And a managing director of the Illinois Shakespeare Festival. He holds an MA from Missouri State University and a PhD from the University of Missouri. He is currently working on his first book, a critical biography about Pulitzer Prize winning playwright Lanford Wilson. Derek is also an award winning director and an accomplished actor and a longtime member of Actors' Equity. He worked in New York City in many, for many years as an arts administrator for the internationally acclaimed Ballet Hispanico and the Tony Award-winning The Acting Company. His presentation today is titled, Connecting to the Laramie Project on a Digital Platform. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much to Carlos, Amy, and Beliza for this opportunity to share my story about the Laramie Project. 
When COVID-19 hit and we were all left scrambling to transition to online teaching, I got very worried about my acting for non-major students. The sense of community and friendship we had created in the classroom was about to be shattered. Teaching non-majors, I have found that students from the general population are often surprised by what happens in a theater class. Theater games and exercises create a sense of play. While the autoethnographic monologues I ask students to write and perform are often deeply personal. As a result of the monologues and theater games, friendships and bonds are created that we as theater people often take for granted. Non-majors simply are not used to the intimacy of the theater classroom and they are often surprised by the experience. So I was worried about what a sudden separation would mean. We were getting ready to start duet scenes and they were very excited, but scene study for non-majors was not going to work without face-to-face -face interaction. The university was pushing us to do asynchronous classes, but I was hesitant. I wanted to do something that would keep us all together, a project that would somehow retain the sense of community that we had created while still working toward our learning goals. With almost no time for planning, I decided to try the Laramie Project. Most of us know the story of Matthew Shepard's brutal murder in 1998 and the play that was devised by Moises Kaufman in the Tectonic Theater Project. Matthew Shepard was killed because he was gay. It was a hate crime that shocked our nation out of its complacency and into action. Much to my surprise, when I presented my class with the project, I discovered that no one had ever heard of Matthew Shepard or the Laramie Project. So I needed to put together an introduction. When I began my research, I discovered a second hate crime and a second story that needed to be told. The story of James Burt Jr., a black man living in Texas. A few months before Matthew Shepard's death, James Burt Jr. was kidnapped by three white men, tied to the back of, of a truck, and dragged until his body was ripped apart. I wanted my students to know about both men and both hate crimes, because out of so much hate came some good. During 2019, President, 2009, President Obama signed the Matthew Shepard and James Byrd Jr. Hate Crimes Prevention Act with Shepard and Byrd's families by the president's side. I gave my class the information I'm sharing with you today, and we watched a few video clips about both men. We had a difficult discussion about hate crimes in America. I could not have known at the time just how important my second bullet point would become when just a few weeks later, George Floyd was murdered by a white cop in what is undoubtedly one of the most traumatizing hate crimes in recent memory. George, George Floyd's murder also shocked our nation out of its complacency and into action. My focus at the time was to move on to the Laramie Project, but I can't help but think about the one, one of the questions posed in the opening plenary. What do we have to fear or gain by doing anti-racist work? I find myself asking, what more could I have done in our discussion about hate crimes? I invited my friend Deborah Maddock, a film actor, to join the class as a guest artist to help with acting for the camera. I polled the class and they unanimously voted to meet synchronously. Students were feeling lonely, depressed, and anxious. Their other classes were meeting asynchronous, asynchronously and they felt isolated. I was concerned that some of my students were going to disappear. A few were absent at first, but I sent reminders encouraging them to join the class and before long, we were, we were in rehearsals. I only lost contact with one of 19 students. I believe the friendships that were established earlier in the semester and the fact that we were meeting synchronous, synchronously played an important role in the success of the project. I kept the character analysis that was supposed to go with scene work. I asked each actor to introduce themselves in character using their worksheet. Everyone had fun with the exercises and I found their analytic work to be strong. We had a few technical glitches during the performance, but everyone soldiered on. I collected qualitative data from their weekly reflections, both pre and post performance for assessment purposes. 16 out of 18 students responded to the pre-performance prompt, 
describe your state of mind about acting and your role in the Laramie Project. Are you enjoying the process? What are you discovering about acting for the camera? All 16 students stated they enjoyed doing the Laramie Project, indicated a strong connection to the material, although several students admitted the subject matter was grim. Approximately 75% of students enjoyed acting for the camera, while the remaining 25 had reservations about acting for the camera, expressing anxiety and stress about the coronavirus and their ability to focus away from the classroom. Students were unanimous in their appreciation of our guest acting coach. Student D states, I am really enjoying acting for the camera because it is a very useful skill to be able to speak, act on camera, especially during these quarantine times with job interviews over Zoom. Student M states, I think this play had a very important message and I really enjoyed reading it. 18 out of 18 students responded to the post-performance prompt, reflect on your growth as a performer this semester. Describe two things you have learned from the class and that you will apply in other life settings. The post-performance comments were overwhelmingly positive and led me to believe the project had been successful. Student O states, being able to view things from another's perspective is important because it gives rise to empathy for the other person. Too much negativity, violence, and hatred in this world arise because people are simply unwilling to empathize. In conclusion, I believe our work meeting synchronously twice a week was the right choice. The presentational style of the Laramie Project was effective for the Zoom Brady Bunch effect. Students really connected to the play and the story of Matthew Shepard. Furthermore, our discussion about James Byrd Jr. and hate crimes was important. Many non-major students expressed gratitude about learning to effectively use the digital platform for job interviews, thus addressing one of our course goals to develop an awareness of how the actor's performance process may benefit other areas of your life. Personally, I was very grateful to have Deborah by my side because I did not feel quite so alone while dealing with my own anxiety about COVID-19. And finally, the feeling of community and collaboration we all created twice a week during an incredibly uncertain and frightening time was perhaps the most successful feature of our efforts. Thank you again for this opportunity to tell my story. Thank you so much, Derek. And now we have Megan Brody. Megan is an associate professor of theater and a faculty member of gender, women's and sexuality studies program at your sinus college. She is also a director, a dramaturg and a playwright and is currently writing a play titled Claude and Marcel about lesbian surrealist artist and resistance fighter, Lucy Schwab and Suzanne Maher. Megan holds a PhD from Cornell University and her published work includes subjects like queer casting and feminist directing. She also co-edited two anthologies of performance pieces written by LGBTQ youth and allies and partner with the Remember the Women Institute on several projects about women theater and the Holocaust. Her presentation today is titled The Art of Empathy, one living newspaper radio play written by nine students in six states over five weeks during the COVID-19 pandemic. Thank you, Belize. At our Sinus College, I teach a senior seminar course on the living newspaper that also fulfills the college's core capstone requirement. Core capstone courses must provide the students with significant opportunities to build upon their work with regard to the four questions that guide students learning at Ursinus. What should matter to me? How should we live together? How can we understand the world? What will I do? My course investigates the Federal Theater Project, FTP, and the role it played in American society from 1935 until its demise in 1939. Together, we read living newspapers like One Third of a Nation, Liberty Deferred, Can You Hear Their Voices, study the units of the FTP, and interrogate how theater can effectively serve as a vehicle for education and social change. The course culminates in an original living newspaper devised and performed by the students and open to the public. In March of this year, my capstone students were working on their own living newspaper when COVID-19 hit and classes were moved online. 
their biggest hurdles were those of time, space, and technology. The class was composed of nine students in six states, and they had only five weeks until their living newspaper performance date. The course is collaboration driven, so asynchronous learning wasn't an option. We met synchronously twice a week for 75 minutes per class period via Zoom. We supplemented these meetings with a class group me, a free group messaging app, to enable regular class communication between the students and me and among students themselves. To this, we added several shared folders in Google Drive so I could respond to students' work in process. Without this technological scaffolding, real-time artistic collaboration would have been significantly more challenging. The students voted to scrap their initial work on a living newspaper about technology and youth culture and opted to begin again, this time focusing on the pandemic that was shaping every moment of our lives. Despite the live performative possibilities of Zoom, the radio play format made the most sense because each student could record their own audio and upload to Anchor, a free podcast creation platform suggested to me by one of my students. Drawing on over 60 different sources, the students devised and recorded the living newspaper radio play entitled Isolated Together, Stories of the COVID-19 Pandemic, a collage of student authored monologues, songs, news clips, and narration that offers listeners varied perspectives on the pandemic and its effects on a diverse representation of American lives. While their work drew on many of the skills honed during an undergraduate career in theater, dramaturgy, performance, playwriting, and even sound design and engineering, perhaps most striking is the relationship between embodiment, empathy, and art, evident in the final product and in the students' reflections on it. Although a listener of the radio play may not appreciate the embodied component of an actor's performance, each vocal work is a representation of the actor's physical, mental, and emotional embrace of the characters of a character. The characters were created by the students themselves and the characters monologues are rooted in extensive research which included an array of sources such as newspaper articles, interviews, websites, and videos. The students coordinated to ensure that collectively they were covering as many perspectives as possible. This playwriting prompted a level of empathy and insight I had not necessarily expected of students, particularly those negotiating the frightening and uncertain landscape of daily life during a pandemic. Here, I had intended to share some scholarship on embodiment, empathy, and learning outcomes. But after an extended back and forth, just with myself, given the social distancing guidelines, about your academic expectations of me, I ultimately chose to share something that a Project Muse, JSTOR, and or library catalog search won't yield. The writing of one of my students. And yes, it was difficult to choose just one. I think this demonstrates the potential of humanizing the digital. One living newspaper monologue written by a student um, and from the perspective of a 55 year old businessman from Arizona discussing a recent trip to Costco ends with the following lines. Look, I know some people have been upset with the people who are stocking up, but I'm really not trying to hurt you. In a world like this, there are no rules, especially when you have annoying teenagers who complain when you run out of things. It's weird. I, I thought to myself, why doesn't it bother me that other people may not be able to get these things? And I think it's because I don't know them. I know my family, my friends, and I would share with all of them. Hell, if I knew you, I'd share with you. I'm not a bad person, but I can't bring myself to worry about everyone. I, I think that would drive me crazy. I've had a hard enough time worrying about my loved ones. Worrying about the whole world would surely kill me at least before any virus could. In her end of the semester reflection paper, the playwright behind that monologue commented on her process. These are her words, again. I wrote a monologue about a panic buyer a 55-year-old businessman named Bill from Arizona. The reason I decided to make him a businessman is because I know in the world of business, there's a lot of competition so that you can secure the best spot. I felt this fit perfectly with panic buying. Also, he is a dad, which added to his desire to provide, which is stereotypically a father figure's role. I personally felt that someone who fully subscribes to all the masculine stereotypes that have been imposed by society on men would be the one to try to be the best when it comes to providing for his family 
during a crisis despite the effect of his actions on others. I thought about the ending of the monologue quite a bit before I wrote it. I feel like in times like this, it's very easy to condemn people. I'm absolutely not saying that buying more than you need despite others being in need is a good thing, but there isn't just one side to the situation. There can be an emotional disconnect for people when they don't know or interact with the people they're affecting. Some people have trouble with empathy. And even though they would help you if they knew you personally, they may have trouble understanding and appreciating the needs of those with whom they have never directly interacted. This 22 year old woman made a rather extraordinary effort to inhabit the world of a character with whom she shares almost nothing in common. She managed to write a monologue about a villainized pandemic character, the affluent panic buyer. And she did this with remarkable understanding and empathy. She creatively synthesized social circumstances, gender norms, and human psychology. Her monologue is an erudite meditation on the four questions that inform students' undergraduate studies at her sinus. But like the best of the living newspapers, her work invites audiences both to practice empathy and to recognize their own power to make change. Given the national political climate, the imperative work of the Black Lives Matter movement, the ongoing pandemic and the assault on the value of higher education, I cannot think of a better way of engaging theater students to make their voices heard than resurrecting FTP's living newspaper, harnessing the power of radio and or audio streaming on demand, and asking students to practice the creative empathy needed to find our way out of this dumpster fire. Please vote. Thank you. Thank you, Megan. Yes, vote. <laughs> and uh, so our next uh, panelist is Linda Shrekli, and she's an educator, a writer, and a theater practitioner. She specializes, specializes in stagecraft composition, performance research, and consumer consciousness. Her current research interests include interdisciplinary ap applications of oral history and designing performance-based teaching and learning strategies for the writing classroom. She teaches in the freshman writing program at Tulane University. Linda holds a PhD in communication studies from Louisiana State University with an area focus in performance studies. Her presentation today is titled Scripted Translations, Decoding the Essay Through Mediated Design. Thank you, Belisa, for that warm introduction. Um, and thank you to the conference and the panelists and to everybody in attendance. I appreciate the opportunity to share my work with you. Um, as Belisa mentioned, um, I am uh, teaching in the freshman writing program at Tulane University. And my interests and backgrounds are in performance studies and oral and written communication. And I'm interested in the translation process that happens between these two modalities and often driven by bridging the pedagogy of performance for other disciplines. So when we found ourselves in the pandemic and um, I'm, I'm teaching composition, I'm looking for strategies and experiments um, to enhance assignments that will allow students to um, make the most out of our predicament. So I experimented with, for the first time, a multimodal essay assignment. Um, and some of the questions that I allowed to focus my work were, um, why is the academic essay genre difficult for many students to learn or for us to teach? And why do some students plateau in their writing skills? Um, also, I'm very interested in students' prior knowledge and understanding how languages that they already speak and know can help them translate processes of writing for themselves. And then of course, I'm interested in understanding how the magic of performance pedagogy can help in the writing process. So the assignment was to create a multimodal essay by revising and adapting a previous essay into a new communication mode. The goals were through enacting a relationship between investigation, script analysis, and mediated design, the students would learn how to combine skills of analysis, argument, autobiography, audience adaptation, and communication mode translation in order to enhance their fluency in digital technologies 
media and information literacy, and hopefully become stronger writers in the process. This assignment was inspired by the My Story Theory and Practice of Gregory Ulmer, uh, who developed a research method that crosses professional, professional, personal, and popular discourses that allow for diverse methods, texts, and perspectives to affect the research um, method. It was also uh, influenced by uh, multimodal learning and research. And very briefly, multimodal learning for me allows us to bring more of our sensory apparatus into the learning, and in my case, writing practice, so that we move beyond the uh, purely linguistic capacity of writing into the visual, oral, gestural, and spatial dynamics of communication in order to influence uh, the writing practice. The assignment had three stages. Um, they were multi, I'm sorry, uh, orientation, translation, and reflection. The orientation section asked students to overtly answer the question, why do I care about this topic? And then dramatize uh, how their subject called their attention through what's called a ground zero narrative or a personal story that tells the audience how you became interested in your subject. Then they were asked to devise a script, an oral presentation script for a multimodal product that could have been, if you'll take a look to the right, a blog, a vlog, a video essay, a podcast, an infographic presentation or a slide presentation or a website page. Um, this, as we know, the, the script uh, in performance is the backbone of our stage work and it allows the translation process to take place. And then finally, they were asked to do a reflection, a brief assessment of their work, where they were really thinking critically about how their design choices affected their audiences. And I just want to talk about some of their um, outcomes. So the outcomes were varied and I was thrilled because in the middle of the pandemic, I was not really quite sure how this was gonna go, um, where their energy was at, morale seemed a little low and it felt like they were re-energized. It was some of the strongest work of the semester. Um, and I think that students gravitated toward video essays and podcasts, which were some of the more complicated design elements rather than um, slideshows, which seemed to potentially be the easiest. Um, and uh, it allowed them, I noticed, to focus on their grounding questions early in their process. So asking the questions of what do I want to know and what do I want to re reveal to my audience happened sooner in their research. Um, they were also able to achieve more organizational clarity for themselves. And I think this is because um, the design work was linked to the recursive practice of writing so that they were moving be between versions of their drafts um, in a way that was very useful to them. It allowed them to develop a more personal investment in their, um, pro in their process and product. And I got a really clear sense that their work represented them and their sense of readership, their audience changed from potentially an audience of one, me, um, and possibly some peers into um, uh, a viewership, which kind of uh, tuned the stakes in a little bit more for them. Um, and for me, the aha moment was also uh, the script gave them a, an ability to um, have a role um, so that their characters um, they were characters in their scripts. They went from being narr um, academic writers to narrators, directors, and hosts. Um, and finally, I think that they were able to find what Greg Almer called the wide image, an aesthetic embodiment of one's attunement with the world, orienting, orienting themselves in the dialogue of research and world events. And so why did this work? I think it had something to do with design and dimension. Uh, the ability for us to take the essay off of the page and onto a hyper-visual plane, put the essay on its feet. And it went from a one-dimensional page to texture, depth, and a resensitized sense of the experience itself. And this is not unlike the relationship we have to the script and the stage. 
And some research on composition pedagogies supports this. For instance, Robert Connors, who writes on syntactical um, methods of pedagogy, suggests that the ability to design is the basis of mature writing style or pro style. And William Gruber takes it a step further and says that, and I love this phrase, an inability to write is an inability to design, an inability to shape effectively the thought of a sentence, a paragraph, or an essay. And this is, of course, supported by the work of Kristen Arola and uh, Jennifer Shepard and Cheryl E. Ball, who wrote the fantastic Writer Designer, A Guide to Making Multimodal Projects. If anyone's interested in adapting multimodal projects for their classrooms, this is definitely a text worth getting. And so that leaves us with what's next for me and what I, what I learned about this as an educator. Um, like I said, students were really gravitated towards some of the more complicated design work. And so I really want to make sure that I'm relying on their prior knowledge in the classroom um, as, a, as a way for them to translate assignments and, and um, the tasks at hand into um, languages that they do understand. Um, their writing, energy, investment, and voices all improved. And next time I'd like to see what happens if we do the translation process in the other direction, if we start with a smaller multimodal piece and then translate that into the traditional essay format. I'd also like to, and I don't know how difficult this is gonna be, um, try to find a way to include perform design, um, whether that be a performed or recorded dramatic scene, monologue, performance poetry, or lyrical dramatization. And finally, I think that um, this opportunity gave me an, a, a way to understand how to optimize digital languages and the performative instincts of students in this new virtual landscape that we find ourselves in, in order to bridge the world of virtual learning and human connection. Thank you so much. And thank you to the students um, and faculty of Tulane University's freshman writing program for their support and commitment. Thank you so much, uh, Linda. Um, now we have as our next presenter, uh, Timothy Jensen. Timothy is a director, a performer, a playwright, and an educator. He received an Audelco nomination for best direction of a play for his New York City production of On Strivers Row. He's a member of the Lincoln Center Theater Directors Lab and his performance highlights include Legends, Regina at the Scottish Opera, a chorus line on Broadway and in, on its national tour, and The Temptation of St. Anthony at the Melbourne International Arts Festival. His play, Listening to the Trees, achieved semi-finalist status for the 2012 Eugene O'Neill National Playwrights Conference. Timothy is currently an associate professor of theater arts at, at Marymount Manhattan College. Uh, today's presentation is titled Tutti, an abstract monologue performance exercise. Thank you very much, Beliza, for that rousing introduction. Woo, you made me sound like somebody. I know my mother appreciates that, Beliza. Hello, everybody out there. Oh. Thank you so much for giving of your time to attend this plenary. It is my absolute pleasure and honor to get to spend this time with you. I'd like to dedicate my presentation to the memory of my mother, Mary M. Johnson, who was and continues to be my most influential teacher. Thank you, mama. <laughs> The inspiration for this exercise arose this past spring, a couple of weeks into my transition to teaching at Zoom University, as my students affectionately would refer to it. I literally called upon my higher power, the spirit energy of my ancestors, my faith, my former teachers, and my mother asking them to help me to come up with new pedagogical exercises that might positively and productively enhance my students' process work experience on Zoom. And soon after this plea, hallelujah, this exercise was born. 
I decided to name this exercise Tutti. Tutti is defined as all voices or all instruments together. The objective of this exercise is for the class to perform collectively their individual monologues the first time unmuted, yes, unmuted, followed by a second performance soon after in which they are all muted. Here are the instructions for, the step-by-step -step instructions for doing 2D. Part one, unmute, yes. Please instruct each performer to un unmute their computer or iPhone. Stand, have each performer adjust the screen of their computer or iPhone to enable them to be seen standing at least from their head to their knees. Number three, places, lights up. Tell the performers that at some point, soon after they are all comfortably set up to stand, you will give them, as the instructor, a places, lights up call. Number four, perform. After they hear the places, lights up from the instructor, all the performers should individually and impulsively begin to simultaneously perform their monologue. Number five. Remain standing slash listening until they hear the instructor say blackout. Once each student's individual performance has ended, they should remain standing and still with the objective to listen to the sounds of the other continuing performances until they hear the instructor say blackout. Number six, the instructor will say blackout after they are convinced that all students have completed their performance. Part two. After the instructor says blackout, give the students the following instructions. Number one, mute. Have each performer mute their computer or iPhone. Number two, stand. Have each performer return to where they previously stood to enable them to be seen standing, at least from their knee to their head. Number three, places, lights up. Remind the performers that at some point soon after they are all comfortably set to stand, you, the instructor, will give them a places, lights up. Number four, perform. After they hear the instructor say places, lights up, all the performers should individually and impulsively begin to simultaneously perform their monologue. Number five, Remain standing and listening until they hear the instructor say blackout. Once each student's individual performance has ended, they should remain standing and still with the new objective to remain in character free associating thoughts until they hear the instructor say blackout. Number six, the instructor will say blackout after they are convinced that all students have completed their performance. I'm just gonna share with you a brief summary of my students' responses to performing 2D. Number one, it got them out of their head, <laughs> which is nice, right? Especially for young acting students. Number two, their want to be heard by their imaginary scene partner was significantly increased. Number three, organically, it upped their personal investment in the text, leading them to more freely and spontaneously play, summoning impulses, one thought, one breath, one sound at a time. Several students did share with me that during the unmuted performance, they realized that they were self-conscious of being heard and critiqued by their classmates. They also admitted that they experienced this same self-consciousness during traditional classroom performances. Yet during the muted performance of Tutti, they relaxed knowing that they couldn't be heard by their classmates. This brave admission of these students led me to engage the class in a discussion about possible tactics they could employ that might help to alleviate self-consciousness when a student or a professional performer is performing in front of their peers. 
my personal experience of witnessing my students' performance of Judy was miraculously transformative. For the seeming limitation on Zoom with the, of course, the audibility issue of overlapping sound, it was overwritten by a beautiful symphony of collective sound. Yes, at times an individual voice had audible prominence, yet throughout the unmuted performance of Chuty, there was a communal expression of activated thought that literally burst through the screen of my little laptop computer. In closing, if you'd like an instructional handout to Tutti, please know that Amy has kindly offered to make it available in the chat and on the ATHA website. I'd like to extend my great appreciation to Amy, Beliza, and Carlos Alexis for your awesomely generous assistance. Thank you very much, Amy, Beliza, and Carlos Alexis. And I'd like to wish you all a wonderful joy-filled exploration as you unearth exciting new pedagogical exercises that will happily marry this virtual medium with sparkling creativity. Thank you so much. Uh, Timothy, I think we should do something together. We have a similar energy. <laughs> uh, thank you so much. Our next presenter is Monica Payne. She is a theater and film director. She's also the artistic director of Theater Lumina, a company focused on cross-cultural collaboration and international exchange. Her device piece about global displacement titled Song of Home Tour the East to Eastern Europe in February of 2020, just on time before everything came down. She is a resident director at Trapdoor Theater in Chicago and a member of the Lincoln Center Directors Lab. Monica is a Meisner-based acting teacher and has taught at Carnegie Mellon, UCLA, Point Park University, and the school at Steppenwolf. She holds an MFA in directing from UCLA and currently teaches at Tulane University. Her presentation today is titled Embracing Toy Theater in the Wake of COVID, Small in Scale but Vast in Imagination. Hello everybody, my name is Monica Payne and I teach at Tulane University in New Orleans. I'm here today to talk about a toy theater unit that I created in the springtime. And I just want to take this moment to acknowledge my colleague Jessica Thebus at Northwestern, who really helped me get focused on toy theater and its possibilities in this moment of global crisis. So I just want to say thank you to her. Um, so essentially, I was teaching a performance project course in which my students were going to put together a classroom version of Carol Churchill's Love and Information. And we had people at various skill levels in the room, people with various interests in either acting or directing, and we were working toward that live performance. So once COVID hit, I decided to really make a strong pivot and move them to toy theater. So if you don't know about toy theater, I highly recommend a little bit of a deep dive. It is a really cool form. It's brought to us courtesy of the Victorian era. And it is essentially people would go to the theater and then they could buy this little paper miniature version of the stage and they could buy the characters that they had seen. So they could bring that home and set it up in the parlor and entertain friends. It was a way of kind of recreating what had happened at the theater. So. Uh, the first thing I asked my students to do was each to now as a solo artist to choose a section of the text and bring it to matchbox scale because I was really looking for something that 
would make sense like in the Zoom box in which we now were living and so many students were kind of isolated with not a lot of space. So they really brought some amazing stuff. I, I asked them to use what they had, go into the kitchen, use food that's there, use paint, markers, paper, um, the family pet, and anything that might be available to you, it, it was on the table. So first they did the matchbox scale and they did, they did those live on Zoom for us. And then we moved toward um, developing basically a shoebox scale version of the piece as their final project. And they did live dress rehearsals and then they actually recorded the finals in a master shot for me. So again, they were encouraged to use what they had. In many cases, they ended up using uh, parents or roommates as uh, additional puppeteers or additional hands on deck because as they soon discovered it takes a lot of hands to really do do the things you imagine so I want to show I'm going to show you one of the final projects here this is by my student Emily and she's using a section from the text called X so enjoy I'm glad we've done it, just to see. So am I, after all these years. <laughs> because it was very important at the time. It's been very important. It has for me, all my life, very important. So never to have seen each other again would have been- It would have been impossible. It would have been sad anyway. You remember the Italian restaurant? No, yes, on the corner was it? With the bushes outside? No, I'm mixing it up with- I can see the waiter now. No, I can't get the waiter. The waiter with the mustache who always smiled so much when we came in? I used to have spaghetti carbonara and you had vongole. I can't remember eating. No, I was too busy looking at you probably. I really loved you then. I loved you. I always remember you standing in that field. I wonder where that was. Was it- All the buttercups? I've got a really clear picture of you running ahead of me down a street. We were running for a bus, I think. Do you remember that hotel? We took a room for a couple of hours in a hotel. There was green wallpaper and we stood there kissing. I remember the first time. No, that's got overlaid by so many other times. I can't. I remember once by a river. We were practically on a public footpath. The kitchen! The kitchen at your friend's house? Which friend? I never knew your friend's names. Was it Chris? Terry? I don't know. You remember the kitchen? I might if I knew which house. Did we do it in the kitchen? Behind the door. There was soup on the cooker. I remember us just looking at each other. The time in the street, we just stopped. I was thinking more time when you were sitting on the side of the bed. Was that early on or near the end? Near the end, I think. Do you know the time I mean? I sometimes go past that coffee shop. Which one? The one where we kept trying to say goodbye. I think I've blotted that whole day out. We were really happy. Or sad. We used to cry. Did we? Sometimes. Thank you. Sorry, I, I keep seeing... I can see... I can't stop seeing- I wish I could stop it for you. Short of smashing in my skull. They say time, you may be able to forget. Even if it's a long time. Once it's in there, once you know that stuff. I really loved you then. I loved you.
So I just want to say in closing, one of the most remarkable things about this unit is that the scale became so small, but the imagination was then able to get so vast. And the students began to see themselves more as storytellers than anything else, which for me was a major accomplishment. Um, I was just thrilled with the way their thinking evolved. So thank you so much for watching and listening, and I look forward to the conversation. Thank you, Monica, so much. Uh, now we have our last presenters, and uh, they are Shine Rouge and Margaret L Lorena Kant. Shine Rouge is the director, performer, and teacher, and senior lecturer uh, in acting and movement on BA acting, collaborative and device theater at the Royal Central School of Speech and Drama in London. She specializes in Chekhov technique and Mayer Holtz biomechanics. Recent directing includes Concert at the Pit, Barbican, Baryshnikov's Art Center, New York, Night Just Before the Forest, Macau Arts Festival, uh, China, and Out of, the, Out of Time, which was nominated for Oliver and Dan's Critics Circle Award. She is the author of Michael Chekhov's Acting Technique, A Practitioner's Guide. And her current research is on polyphonic characterization, where the role is played by an ensemble of actors. Margaret Lorena Kempt is an actor, a multidisciplinary theater and performance artist, a writer, and a teaching artist. Her research explores authorships and spatial politics through performance. Most recently, she co-directed Antigone Now with Shine Rouge. Her new solo performance, This Land Is, was commissioned by and performed at the Elaine Jacobs Gallery in Detroit, Michigan. Her recent films include Bloodbound in 2019 and The Ten Cent Daisy, which will be released in 2021. Her recent stage work included The Christians at B Street Theater at B Street Theater, and her next project is Click by Jacqueline Goldfinger, adapted for the internet by the author. Their presentation is titled Antigone Now, a performance film made in response to COVID-19, rehearsed, directed, and created online. It's really interesting how there can be so many different versions of one character. And you know, they're, they're having a whole cast play one character so i think that really shows how there's your your own life and your own experiences can 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 produce a different version of a character you know our brother Eteocles has been buried as a soldier with full honors so he has gone home to the dead but not polynices our brother Polynices is denied any burial at all. The man obsessed is a cock of the walk in a hurry towards the worst. Our luck is little more than a short reprieve. Our luck is little more than a short reprieve. Help me to lift my brother's body. The future is cloth. Help me waiting, waiting to, to be, be cut. cut. I'll bury him myself. Thank you, Belisa. 
and to Amy and Carlos for all your work and for your invitation today. Um, that was just a short extract of a 15 minute film called Antigone Now. Um, I was invited by Margaret as the Granada artist in residence at the University of California, Davis, to direct a stage production of the Greek tragedy Antigone. And with lockdown, when it was becoming clear that I wasn't gonna be able to go, Margaret and I started to imagine what we might do instead. And given that we were in a world pandemic, a, a crisis, it felt really essential to try to do something and respond creatively to this moment. So we reimagined the play as a performance film instead, rehearsing it online and Margaret and I collaborating together to edit it. Uh, we stripped the play back to the telling of the story of Antigone so that the all female cast who had been cast in the previous quarter um, would all play Antigone and a kind of polyphony, a chorus. We ran daily rehearsals synchronistically online and um, we did some ensemble work and just to say a little bit about um, techniques that we used in the rehearsal process. Both um, Sinead and I work with the Michael Chekhov um, technique. So bar using quite a bit of that, as well as um, I sort of thought about the idea of moment work as we were taking moments from the play and thinking about those physically and giving the actors an opportunity to expand on that in their, in their study of the performance. Um, they would do ensemble work and then send the actors off to film sections of the script um, wherever they could using their phones, their laptops, their iPads. They would upload the films at, to a shared drive and we'd give them feedback either on by mail or online. And when needed, we would give some additional coaching, um, particularly with the text work. Um, because we were both interested in retaining the integrity of that element of the play, the play as if it were performed live. Um, we, they had very uh, time zone challenges as we had actors in Singapore, Japan, the East, the West Coast of the US and um, Sinead being in London. Um, some actors, in fact, were rehearsing at midnight or 2 a.m., which gives you the idea of how much this performance and the um, wanting to, to go on and, and do the play that our actors had committed. I also wanted to just mention that we had one day for sure that was uh, what we call an all day and it was Saturday where everyone that was involved with the performance um, needed to attend because we felt that it was very important for the actors to still feel that they had a sensation of um, ensemble and community as part of the rehearsal process. I think one of the challenges was to really make something coherent out of so many different homes, bedrooms, and so much, uh, so much difference in their te technical capability. But uh, Margaret and I made a conscious decision to really try to embrace the glitchy, low-tech internet quality of what we were doing. Yes. Um, so while we thought maybe we would have extra mics or something like that in the beginning, we actually decided that um, that wouldn't be useful. So the actors are just using whatever they have at home. And also that sort of allows us to think about that question of access with different actors from different walks of life and different abilities. So everybody has the same access. Um, we wanted to um, speak to the isolation of the moment that is the heart of the play and is the dead body of Antigone's brother who she is forbidden to bury or touch. This image of the body that cannot be touched or accompanied began to resonate with the stories of all those who couldn't be with their relatives in hospitals and families who couldn't gather with their communities to have proper burials and, and funeral rites. Through the ensemble of actors, 
This expanded the body of Antigone, if you like, in each seclusion. We tried to evoke something of the breath of Antigone's grief um, across the, the spectrum of humanity that were this play. I mean, we had people from almost really all over the globe engaging in this production, as well as the experience of this moment in history. Originally for this stage production, we wanted to have a chorus of Antigones on stage all of the time, as Margaret said, a kind of polyphony, uh, where we were displacing the traditional Greek chorus to the main protagonist. Um, and Margaret and I had discussed how often the traditional Greek chorus is really quite boring uh, on stage. But suddenly we find ourselves during COVID-19, this, this, this idea of the chorus suddenly feeling terribly important. Um, in lockdown, the civic chorus we realized was absent. And there was a mourning for our sense of collective, our togetherness, our capacity to come together and be with each other. So in the film, all these isolated Antigones may be trapped behind their internet frames, but nevertheless, they're still striving to contact their humanity in spite of the difficulty of the moment. Antigone defies the state, buries her brother in secret, and is put to death for it, but she stands up for what she believes in. It's an act of protest that she defends her values with her life. Lockdown felt like a moment for us all to consider what our true values are and what really matters and orients our lives. Thank you so much for giving us the opportunity to share this work. It's, it's slow, it's slow, but we're coming. I don't see myself. I don't know if you can hear me. Can you hear me, Shine? You're the only yes, person- I can I hear can you and see you. <laughs> oh, you see me, okay. <laughs> Thank you so much to all of you. That was uh, wonderful. So um, I, love, I love to show my seams. So here it is. This is the first time uh, we use uh, the Q&A session. And it's interesting because uh, still people, some, some of our panelists have answered some of your questions. Um, so um, uh, it's, it's interesting because sometimes I was like, Oh, now I can't ask the question. <laughs> so if you have uh, any questions, again, lower bar, right side, uh, there's the Q&A little icon. So you can add your questions there so I can read them to um, our panelists. So I will go to some of them here. Uh, the first one I can see is um, for Monica, and it says, Monica, are there any parameters or guidelines that you think makes the exercise especially successful? It is a, absolutely wonderful, and I can see how it can be paired with other types of projects as well. Hello, everyone. Thanks for the question. So I think uh, I, I did actually give parameters both at the matchbox size and at the shoebox size because I felt like the students were craving structure. So I did issue a list, uh, you know, saying you've got to shoot this. If you're putting it on camera, it has to be in a master shot. Uh, you know, any matchbox will do, but I was, um, you know, keeping them at this super small scale. And, and I did give some other guidelines. I asked them to use music. In the final project, I asked them to physically appear on camera, at least for a moment, which you saw in the student clip. So I, I did, I, I just basically created the parameters, thinking about what might make a nice final composition. Um, but I do think it helped them to just have some basic guidelines because they were all new to the form. Mm -hmm. And I'm happy to, I don't have them right this moment, but if somebody wants to reach out to me, I'm happy to share the guidelines. Um, I'm at uh, M Payne and the number four at Tulane.edu. Thanks. Uh, and there's a few questions for Timothy, so I'll try to put them all together. So first, uh, someone mentions, thank you for the clarity of your instructions. And they, they're asking um, if you ask 
where did you ask the students to focus is one question. Uh, another, how many students were performing? And if you could uh, please talk a little bit more about the logics of having them talk all at the same time. Oh, sure. Thank you, Eliza. Uh, in terms of focus, uh, they did 2D at a point in the process work in which they had already been receiving some coaching from me in class on their monologues. So they had already determined where in their own mind's eye they were seeing their imaginary scene partner. So the focus was on them. And then, forgive me, Belize, I forget the second part of that question. What was the second part? So where do they focus? How many were there? And why oh, talk at the same time? Thank and you very much. And also the name of the monologue. I didn't say that. Thank you very much. Uh, where were they focusing? Uh, huh. My brain just forgot it. You just told me again. The second one was what? Where are they focusing? Um, Where did you tell them to focus? Oh, yep. Answered that. The second one I forgot. Forgive uh, me. Why all talking at the same time? Great. Title of the monologue. And I Great. The monologues were ones that actually I had assigned them thinking, as you know, as teachers, we get to know our students who so are going, oh, this will be good for that one to work on. Yet we did two monologue projects. The second one was where I taught them how to devise writing their very own monologues. Yet we did 2D with both of them. And why all together? Why not? It's about abstraction, baby, because you know what? Abstraction leads to discovery. This is an abstract performance exercise. Yet what it does is it shakes up all your traditional senses about how something should be. My students are obsessed with getting it right. This exercise actually shook them up to the extent that they couldn't figure out how to get it right because it was, it was so freaking weird to them. But I got to tell you, they loved doing it. Thank you. Um, there's uh, the next questions are for Sinead and, and Margaret. Um, how much, <laughs> they keep popping. Uh, how much freedom did the actors have in staging the film for their performance? And how much did your tech and design uh, faculty maybe helped in the process of the filmmaking if, if they did? I can answer the first one, Margaret. Um, if, okay. Uh, um, well, we started out being, uh, we, we created a list of possible scene shots that all of the, the cast had. Um, and then when we started rehearsals, we, we prescribed possible scenes or scenarios for the uh, actors to film. But as the process went on, the actors grew in confidence and uh, they began then to really make their own propositions. And they were watching each other's uh, films on the shared drive. So they began to inspire each other and up each other's ante in an interesting way. So I'd say it began with some, yeah, being relatively prescribed to, uh, to greater, greater levels of freedom as we all uh, grew in confidence and as Margaret and I grew increasingly tired <laughs> and had less ideas. <laughs> and in terms of um, design support, we uh, started out with a, a set designer and a costume designer as you would normally have with a show, but um, the set design went by the wayside because it was really whatever students had available. Um, lighting design, we had um, our lighting person come in and do a tutorial with the students about um, some best practices in lighting. And then we spent one rehearsal where students uh, toured their own places where they might shoot to, so that we could see what was available. So we use that in our imaginations to say, how about this part in the dark hallway? Or how about that part where you have the, the light coming out of your microwave? Um, so we were able to look at what resources they had and make suggestions um, based, based on that. Um, yeah. And I guess the other thing to say is that stage management, we had a lot of support oh, yes, for stage great. management because um, the organizing of the drive and support in uploading the films was wow. pretty epic. <laughs> right. So over um, maybe almost 800, well, I know there were at least 811 um, videos to review 
um, last count. <laughs> so I know that there were more than that, but that's when I stopped looking at the number. <laughs> Thank you so I much. I every single one of them. Uh, so we are running out of time. So sadly, we won't be able to cover all the questions, but there are uh, two questions that I think are for anyone in the panel to answer, and, and that it's a philosophical question. One of them is, uh, and I'm sorry, I haven't read the names of the people before. This one is from Andrew Gaines. Uh, how have you made sense of switching from live theater to another medium of, or platform? And how is it still theater? Uh, in your experience. Can I, may I, may I say one thing? Sure. One of the things that Sinead and I, I spoke about was, was exactly that, what, what makes this still theater. And really one of the main things is that people still had to gather. It wasn't shown like you can see it whenever, you can't go online right now and see it whenever you feel like. There has, there has to be that the gathering, um, which I think is one of the most important elements of theater and also just in terms of creating the the ensemble nature of performance where people share their work and you know you're at rehearsal and you're not in that scene but you're watching and it is doing something to you that you bring to the next thing so for, I, I'm sure there are others but those were two that I was kind of like honing in on. Thank you. Uh, maybe Monica or Megan, if there's something you would like to add to that or, or Linda, Derek. I think for students, um, even working on radio plays, which I'm a huge fan of and would, would recommend to anyone who doesn't want to have to deal with the uncertainty is to plan on a radio play. And it gives you a whole host of options, whether it's performed in front of a live audience, it's streamed, it's Zoomed. Um, but I think that focusing on students' character work, right? How they, how they embody character um, is, it is equally as important for voice, right? That it's not, we don't isolate it in that way, but that you have to fully embrace a character and have a good understanding of who that person is. And so it's equally valid for me, I think, as a director to ask my actors in a radio play to write bios of their characters, the backstory we don't know, um, so that that so that that is something that informs every every moment of their performance that to to take the vocal out from the emotional and the physical I think in some ways doesn't honor the kind of organic being of what an actor brings to the table every day. Thank you. And can I quickly just say that sure. I think it's uh, uh, actually to riff off of what Margaret so beautifully said and Megan. I think the idea of how we can be theatrical in terms of extending that to our students on Zoom is the more we can give them communal community experiences in which they are all collectively working together. They need it. Look at what's going on in the world, y'all. I don't need to tell you. They need to know that they're together, that they can hear each other, screw the disruption of the audible. They don't care. Their, their energy changes when they know I'm not alone. Yeah, I wish I was next to that person in real life, but I can feel them because I can hear them and we're doing something collectively. Each one of us is a link in the chain of humanity. So I strongly encourage you colleagues, please give your students more things to do together on Zoom, build that community. Absolutely. Thank you. So I bought us two more minutes uh, <laughs> so we can hear from those who haven't spoken uh, and, and, or I mean, whoever is inspired by this question. Uh, what do you see as the biggest, this is from Winton Wong, uh, the biggest challenge considering the uncertainty of return, which is not uncertain for everybody, and how might you suggest planning for this? Hmm. <laughs> Derek. <laughs> you mean returning um, like in the fall or the winter? I guess this is the fall, yeah. We're, we're off in the fall. I, I don't know. I actually think it's going to go on much longer than that, but. Yeah, But I do feel like some of the things that we learn, some of the practices that have emerged will continue to flourish and grow. I'm excited about that. Mm -hmm. Radio plays, there are some fantastic radio plays, um, uh, particularly British authors because BBC is still streaming. People are still writing for radio. Um, 
Angela Carter has some amazing radio plays, as does Emma Donahue. Uh, so I think that there's a lot of potential there to be harnessed in a way where you have a backup if something can't be live so that the students see a product brought to fruition and have that sense of community because they can rehearse together online. It's not ideal, but it's possible. And I will add Holly Hughes, uh, The Well of Hoardiness. If you're not in a very conservative play, uh, place, it's really funny, it's queer, and yes. It's amazing. It's amazing, it's amazing. Um, oh no, it's 1.47, we ran out of time. Um, our presenters, I think most questions were answered by you. Um, thank you so much, Derek, Megan, Linda, Margaret. Monica, Timothy, and Sinead. And thank you, Amy, who is our stage manager and keep the magic flowing. <laughs> Bye and see you around. We still have today one more session and two more days of programming. Thank you. Thank you.